Good day to everyone joining us and welcome to today's X Talks webinar. Today's talk is entitled Accurate Suicide Risk Detection with ECSSRS Helps Ensure Safety of Trial Participants and Treatments in Oncology and Beyond. My name is Sonia Hunt and it's my pleasure to be your X Talks moderator for today. Today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes. This presentation includes a Q&A session with our speakers. This webinar is designed to be interactive, and webinars work best when you're involved. So please feel free to submit questions and comments for our speakers throughout this presentation by using the questions chat box, and we'll try to attend to your questions during the Q&A session. Now, this chat box is located in the control panel, and that's found on the right-hand side of your screen. If you require any assistance, please contact me at any time by sending me a message using this chat panel. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. Please note that this event will be recorded and made available to you for future streaming on xtalks.com. At this point in time, I'd like to thank Clario, who developed the content for this presentation. Clario is a leading healthcare research and technology company that generates the richest clinical evidence in the industry. Across decentralized hybrid and site-based clinical trials, Clario's deep scientific expertise, global scale, and the broadest endpoint technology platform allows their partners to transform lives. Now it's my pleasure to introduce you to our speakers for today's webinar. And first, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Kelly Posner, Professor of Psychiatry at the Columbia University. Dr. Posner was commissioned by the FDA to develop the methods to address drug safety questions and they characterize and characterized her work as setting a standard in the field and a lead article in the New York Times called it one of the most profound changes of the past 16 years to regulations. Oh, there she is. Hi there, Kelly. The CSSRS is policy across all 50 states, national agencies, and most countries. Through her advocacy, she has helped change local, national, and international policy, which in turn has contributed to, contributed to reductions in suicide across all sectors of society. Her work with the CSSRS could be like the introduction of antibiotics. The U.S. Department of Defense said her work is nothing short of a miracle and stated her effective model of improving the world will help propel us closer to a world without suicide. And the White House recently highlighted the Columbia Protocol app as helping to achieve the president's mental health and suicide prevention initiatives. Her scholarly work has been included in the compendium of the most important research in the history of the study of suicide, and she has been awarded with the Secretary of Defense Medal for Exceptional Public Service. So there is Kelly. Thank you so much, Kelly. Now it's my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. John Grice. He's the Chief Medical Officer at Merit Solutions. And Dr. Grice trained as an internist and psychiatrist in addition to clinical practice and academic teaching roles. He has developed and evaluated digital assessments and therapies since 1967. And next is my pleasure to introduce you to Libby Thomas. She's a scientific advisor, ECOA Science and Consultant with Clario, and she will be joining us after the presentation as your moderator for the Q&A. So Libby is, as I said, um, is a scientific advisor. She utilizes her curiosity and knowledge of human behavior to provide scientific consultation on electronic clinical outcome assessments in the clinical trial space. Her focus includes diary design best practice, patient advocacy, and human-centered design. Now, it's my pleasure to pass the mic and the controls over to our first speaker, Kelly. So Kelly, when you're ready, you may begin. I'm ready and very excited to be here today with all of you telling you this story, which is, is, is quite important and, and frankly really comes down to how we, what we all need to do to protect subjects and, 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 and to, say, to save lives. So I'm going to start with the punchline that may surprise you. There has never been a medicine shown to increase suicide or suicidal issues, okay? What we've learned, what sponsors have learned, what, what communities have learned and FDA has learned is that we need 
better methods of risk that methods of risk detection were critically necessitated to avoid dangerous false signals that can not only take down an intervention it can and literally has has cost lives so Here's the story, and it's, it's so dramatic that you might not even believe it, right? So the FDA was dealing with um, concerns about whether antidepressants cause people to be suicidal. And, and when they were trying to grapple with this, the, the data interpretability concerns were uncovered. They reviewed sponsor requested data, under, under, uncovered huge variability in approaches. Somebody actually called a slap in the face a suicide attempt. So FDA, I led the team that was commissioned by the FDA to develop a rigorous approach to address these things with controversy that you can't imagine. There was whistleblower, you know, um, this man, Dr. Mossholder, expert kept from speaking, drug report barred by FDA scientists because the FDA knew that it, this was too important of an issue to actually, you know, re rely on, on junk data. And if we didn't have better methods, what would happen is you leave yourself open for a false signal, which in Tom Loughran's words, who was the head of psychiatry products at the FDA, said was equally dangerous to the public health, right? We have to answer these questions, but erring in either direction can be devastating and debunking false notions of risk is equally, equally important. So what did we know? So when we, when I was, um, what, what we knew and know is that, you know, FDA had to make the we had to make the best sense of limited information because all they had were adverse events. And the problem with using adverse events to determine causality is that you can't. You know, what happens is people on active medications have more side effects, right? Headache, stomach ache, whatever it may be. So they have, an investigator may have just had more contact with a provider and more time to hear about his suicidal occurrences. And every single data set showed us that. Right. And, and, and FDA knew this, right? This is their words at one of the advisory hearings that there are many possible explanations for variations within and across programs. Having said that, having said that, the work we did really uncovered some important things. It showed that misclassification can lead to overestimation of risk. When we developed the Columbia system for AEs, you know what it did? It reduced suicide attempts by 50%. We got more precise and lower, lower risk estimates prior to that, you know, that whistleblower um, analysis. And so what did FDA do? Right? They knew that there were variations and that these could be false signals. So for the first time in 16 years, they required the prospective monitoring with the CSSRS. Okay? And, and the reason they did that was because the only, re the only way to tell a causal link is by having a good method across drug and placebo. Right, so they, they sourced the Columbia. This was that New York Times front page article, one of the most profound changes in 16 years to regulations governing drug development because the FDA had only done that one time in their history, cardiac monitoring, you know, 20 years ago, right? So this was so, so critically important. It's, it, and in their guidance where they, they source the Columbia, they say, and you know, it's so important to do one thing. We can't have measurement variability. We can't, it will decrease the opportunity to identify signals. And that impact of imprecision grows when incident rates are low. And we do not want misclassification to profoundly change conclusions about drug effects, which one or two cases can actually do that. And furthermore, we know to expect it everywhere in every medical illness from asthma to cancer. This is just one example. In cancer patients, 17.7% had suicidal thoughts independent of depression. If you have high blood pressure, heart attack, stroke, cancer, epilepsy, arthritis, chronic headache, okay, you're 30 to 160% more likely to have suicidal thoughts and 40 to 90% like, more likely to have, to have made an attempt. You can see this chronic pain, 50% more likely to, have, to die by suicide, psoriasis, 30 to 40%. Right? This story I'm going to tell you, the suicide risk is all about the underlying conditions, 
right? And, and FDA, so you see it in every medical disorder, and FDA and sponsors needed the generalizability. You know, I, I never forget sitting in a meeting with the head of dermatology, and she said to the sponsor, we don't want to hear about these things after, after the fact. So back to the antidepressant story, which is a pretty scary story, okay, um, for, for a minute. You all know that when the FDA has an important decision to make, they have a public health advisory and there's lots of public testimony. Listen to this. You, you need to take action immediately before more innocent people like me and you die horrible deaths. As Americans, we have the right to feel safe and if you were doing your jobs, you would be safe. Why are we worrying about terrorists in other countries when pharmaceutical companies are our biggest terrorists by releasing these drugs on an unsuspecting public? Remember 20 years ago when depressed people would slip, slip away quietly to kill themselves rather than themselves and everyone around them? These drugs change kind, gentle kids into monsters. So you, you get the you get the point, and it's a really scary story. And we were terrified that we were in some horrible natural experiment where you know, people were going to not go on their medicines, and that's exactly what happened. Prescription rates started to plummet after black box warnings, and guess what happened after that? Because people weren't getting the medicines they needed, okay? As prescriptions plummeted, suicide rates increased, okay? In, in the Netherlands, 22% drop in prescriptions, 49% increase in youth suicide. In the U.S., 22% drop in prescriptions, 12% increase in youth suicide. Single largest year-to-year -year increase in suicide with this age group since they started CDC collected data in 1979. This was our worst nightmare and the unintended consequences just kept coming. There was decreased diagnosis and treatment of depression in both children and adolescents. National diagnosis rates, you know, went decreased to 1999 levels. This was out of Yale. Unintended consequence of warnings, academic achievement decreased, substance use decreased, etc. Et what does the science actually tell us about antidepressants and suicide? The evidence is very clear like every other indication or disease, it is un, the untreated depression is, is, is what actually kills, okay? And we know from all over the world that higher rates of SSRIs are associated with lower suicide rates and fantastically robust, robust data. And every country, Japan introduced, you know, increased SSRIs, lower suicide rate, et, et, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, there's all this clinical lore that, um, you know, an antidepressant can cause somebody to be suicidal. What does the data actually show us? The time of greatest risk is, is before they start a medicine, and the pattern after was the same as psychotherapy, meaning the drugs needed a chance to, to work. Autopsy studies are invariably associated with no treatment or lack of compliance. And I went to a meeting with FDA years ago, and because they were requiring the Columbia, the sponsors gave them all of the all of their, their CSSRS data, so they had a massive database. What do you think they saw, of course? As expected, placebo was always associated with higher risk. So this was a study, I mean, an article out of Newsweek, Trouble in a Black Box has this backfired, you know, and, 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 and I, and, Dr. Gibbons, one of the leading um, uh, people in this area, said, you know, that how many people do we have to kill? And FDA said, you know, if we get more data like this, we have to go and revisit the black box. But it didn't stop there. So many other drugs, so many suicide controversies, this impactful drama continued. Singular, okay? One post-marketing case, Cody Miller, 15, moody and anxious, they walked in and he had, they found him, he hanged himself in an upstairs closet. You know how high the suicide rate is and depression 20% without even a disease, right? This was, you know, what does the data actually tell us? When you look at the science, it's the opposite. It's the underlying disease and there's no risk shown. Now here was some good news for a moment, okay? FDA had a public health advisory on um, anti-epileptic anti drugs and there was one post-marketing case where a man hung himself, but they voted against a black box and this was Wall Street Journal, right? This could 
could rekindle controversies over what this could do. They were so struck by all the unintended consequences, including lives lost, you know, with the antidepressants. And th this, frankly, is the story that can happen to any innocent, potentially life-saving medicine. Chantix. Chantix is by far the most effective smoking cessation drug in the world. Smoking kills one in five people. The headlines, this is my brain on Chantix. VA testing drugs on war veterans. A musician who shot a neighbor while trespassing, okay? This is New York Times. Look, prescription rates plummeting. You know, somebody at FDA said, said because they had a black box you know most division directors and the people that commissioned me knew that you you couldn't tell anything causal unless you put in this method across drug and placebo and what happened somebody said they we probably lost 50,000 people who didn't get chantix because of this so but this is the good news you see science conquers ignorance pfizer showed their their over 8,000 patient cssrs data and they voted to remove a black box and that's the good news. And hopefully we'll be seeing a lot more of this. And this is many, many years ago, why sponsors were putting it everywhere from cough to headache, whatever, because before the FDA even started asking for it, because they knew it was an all upside story to protect the, the things that, you know, you spend your lives, you know, trying, trying to help people treat diseases that they really need to be treated. But look at this, everybody. The threat continues even today, right? There have been headlines about the threat to Ozempic. And the thing is, this is from post-marketing cases. And again, the only way you can ever tell causality is across drug and placebo. So three people in Iceland experienced suicidal thoughts while on it. OK, so now, you know, they're going to investigate and they're going to look at post-marketing cases. And again, that won't tell you anything. So we, you guys never know what's gonna be next. So that's the big, big, big take home about why it's silly not to have it everywhere. But it also streamlines study conduct, reduce cost and burden. You know, it's for many, many years, it operationalizes inclusion exclusion. This is an example from endocrinology many, many years ago. If you get the 1% answers on the Columbia, a four or five or a behavior, on trial monitoring, then you refer to a mental health professional, not even exclusion, right? So, so lots of, lots of really, really um, upside. And look at this. This was a 14,000 subject obesity program. When they relied on spontaneous adverse events, they got 452 occurrences. When they moved to systematically monitoring with the Columbia, they got 12 right? You guys don't need all of that, you know, all of that, that extra burden. And another really important thing is its use for efficacy. You know, when your interventions work, suicidal issues get reduced. And FDA has been talking about this for 15 years. Use it as a primary or secondary outcome. And that's really, you know, you guys are going to get all these slides, but lots of data, lots of data. This is in, um, in ketamine, you know, so it, it, it not only picked up response, it picked up partial response. It's one of the reasons that we, we created the Columbia, you know, in, in the first place. And look at this too, new data with millions of patients. This is um, Gibbons and Mann. Dr. Mann is also an author on the Columbia, right? They looked over 150 million patients. And what we see all the time is the vast majority of drugs actually lower the risk of suicidal of suicidal behavior, right? So we know that this is, um, you know, optimal care for subjects, just to, you know, optimal, optimal outcomes. And then what is the optimal method of delivery? It's the, the ECSSRS, which is electronic self-report, which is just really revolutionary. So it used to be you pick up the phone or you're on the computer, you get asked the questions electronically or you read them. There's immediate transfer of information. You get you get perfect data, not just, not just better data, you get perfect data. And Forrest many, many years ago said, my goodness, I mean, the, the transcription errors, they had five suicidal events that, that were just transcription errors. But when you do this, you, you, you avoid all that. 
much lower cost due to significantly less investigator time and 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 lower burden, which allows you to do the science that you need to do. And the Epilepsy Consortium put this nicely, like you get you get the optimal approach because you know they they get this perfect data, they can walk out the 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 um the person waiting for them, the coordinator, can say, "Hey, you said this," so they get the human contact as well as the as well as the optimal data. So, also use of e CSSRS lowered exclusions, you know, to less than five percent versus twenty percent. And the important thing to know is that there's great reliability, and you can, but even more sensitivity. So you can use them together, and that's really important. I've been working with the FDA for, you know, probably close to two decades at this point and we talk about this all the time you know different data going in same same data out you can have radar based you know paper ECSSRS all in the same studies but you really get all this optimal benefit and this was from the Harvard best practices F, you know FDA meeting that we had and it said the optimal solution for minimizing for minimizing bias so just in a, the last few minutes I have, I want to tell you, you know, the, the, the CSSRS is really the global method of detection and, and its potency is what gives you the optimal method of detection to protect your patients. And you'll see examples all over the world reducing suicide critical liability protection, which really helps you. And what, why liability protection? You know, the, the, we don't have a perfect formula. We may never have. People used to say, how can I ask? So malpractice attorneys have written for many, many years that if you ask the Columbia, it protects you because it has more science than we've ever had. 600 studies, 50 of which are predictive, including predicting death by suicide, which has never happened in the field before. And some of the most central studies to those 50 predictive are with Dr. Grice and Dr. Munt that, that involve the ECSSRS, but unprecedented science, which no matter what happens, protects you. And by the way, it's not just in healthcare. When MIT had a suicide, like every university does, the Supreme Court brief wrote about the Columbia as the reasonable standard, which allows the parent or the teacher to be able to ask without that, right? So, so all these examples, and it really lowers, it's the first, one of the reasons it's become the global method is because it's the first time we have evidence-based thresholds for imminent risk. This was an elusive goal that we could never capture, right? And we have, and only 1% of people get that high risk answer. Remember I talked about the endocrinology guidance, if you have a four or five or a behavior. So, you know, this is the, the story, but look at this story. This is what all of our 50 states look like pretty much across the continuum of care, right? Whether you're a policeman in Connecticut or a school in any state and, and state after state has said, you know, since doing this, we've lowered suicide because it's connecting the right people to the, to the care that they need. And I really just wanted to give you a sense of the public health impact and global impact that really su will support helping the people that you're trying to help. And this is the, the global story, which is a really, really cool one. So um, that on that note, uh, that is what I wanted to share with you. And, and we are always here to help in, in, any way, in any way possible. And I will hand it over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Greist. Thanks very much, Kelly, for your wonderful introduction to the enormous and continuously growing role of the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale and its effect in identifying and reducing suicide risk worldwide. My emphasis is on the validated patient self-report electronic Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale, happily abbreviated to ECSSRS. And that provides the clearest signal, as Kelly was saying, of suicide risk for patient subjects in treatment, development studies that are seeking regulatory approvals. The ECSSRS also provides critically important safety 
for new treatments under study. And I'm going to reprise the Vernicline Shantix story briefly to make the point. It was approved for use as treatment for smoking cessation in 2006, and it was and remains twice as effective as its best predecessor medication, bupropion or Welbutrin. And it had rapid commercial uptake since stopping smoking dramatically reduces risk of death from cardiovascular disorders and cancers, far and away the two leading causes of death. The use of Shantix increased to millions of patients. There were inevitable deaths from suicide, which is the 10th leading cause of death. Suicide risk had not been carefully studied in the Shantex development studies, and in 2009, FDA required a black boxed warning for Shantix because of alleged suicide risk, as Kelly has described, and the sales of Shantix decreased by 50%. Same year, Pfizer began that 8,000 patient phase four study of suicide risk, and after its completion, with CSSRS data in 2016, FDA removed a black box warning from a treatment for the very first time. It's unknown how many unnecessary deaths, but it's estimated 50,000, occurred because of false accusations of Shantix suicide risk that led to FDA black box warning. So beyond patient and treatment safety, the ECSSRS also provides the clearest potential signal of additional treatment benefits by possible reduction of suicide risk associated with smoking cessation or treatment of any disorder that is being developed for regulatory approval if ECSSRS data are available. With this as preamble, let's review the issue of assessment quality, first regarding assessor standardization, and then honesty of respondents being assessed. There are many clinical trial assessor challenges, logistics, individual biases, unblinding time pressures, and trainability and training stability. In one depression medication, development program, 31 experienced raters from 15 United States study sites were trained didactically and then were tested on their use of the 17-item Hamilton Depression Rating Scale, the real standard at the time for assessing severity of depression. 57% of the raters qualified on their first try and 93% by the third try but 7% of previously qualified raters never qualified, and they were not permitted to rate during the two years the study was underway at US study sites. After one year of rating, that's midway through the two-year study, the qualified raters were retested, and only 58% of them remained qualified. Retraining requalified all the raters by the third try. And this raises obvious concerns about their performance in the previous and next 12 months. The same investigators looked at causes of rater variance across raters of different experience levels, those that are trained and programmed and reprogrammed, and found that versus those that have very little or no training, but what they found was that differences in how follow-up questions were phrased and differences in which follow-up questions were asked were the most common types of information variants. They also found 92% of the variants came from the raters. Only 8% was from the patient subjects that were being rated. Leading to the conclusion that human rater accuracy is hard to achieve and hard to explain. There's also the question about respondent honesty. There are many stigmatized topics in medicine. When asking a patient about alcohol use in Wisconsin, I would 
say my rule of thumb was to double whatever the patient said. And my oversimplification actually has been confirmed in systematic studies. It was not inaccurate. There's greater patient candor with computer interview than to a clinician across all these topics. The Catholic confessional has a screen between the priest and the penitent. There's a rough empiricism that anonymity elicits candor. 50 years ago, we published results of a computer interview based Bayesian model for predicting suicide risk. The model was developed with clinicians treating patients at University of Wisconsin. The computer was a combination of a micro link laboratory instrument computer and a digital equipment PDP-8 mini computer. Primitive by today's standards, it had tape drives that were no hard drives, blinking lights, six inch diagonal cathode ray tube oscilloscope screen where the questions were presented, a modified typewriter keyboard for patient responses, and a 10 character per second teletype printer. And it worked. We compared the computer model's predictions with their clinicians' prospective risk assessments and found the patients disclosed more suicidal ideation and behaviors to the computer than to their own clinicians, and also that the model was more accurate than their clinicians in predicting subsequent suicide attempts. And you may notice Kelly had mentioned Tom Logren. Well, this was his first paper. He's the fourth author or fifth here, I guess, on this work back in 1973. Other investigators over the years have confirmed greater disclosure of suicidal ideation and behaviors in computer interviews than to clinicians. Patients are prepared to confide information to the computer. They may be unwilling to tell the clinician. And for adolescents, self-rated instruments of suicidality and depression are more sensitive in detecting suicidal risk than rating scales scored by the clinician. And adolescent suicide risk screenings resonate with me personally. In other work, we're using the ECSSRS in universal school screening for suicide risk in Montana, where the adolescent suicide rate is 2.6 times the national average. And in every screening, we always find children with risk unknown to the school or the parents. And here's a study with self-report and clinician ratings of the same suicidal risk items. I'm belaboring this. I wanna make the point. Interestingly, suicidal thoughts and plans were more likely to be endorsed by patients than by clinicians. And clinicians were less likely to use the more extreme rating, strongly agree. These results suggest the possibility that some patients may be more willing to endorse suicidal ideation on self-report assessments, or that some physicians may be reluctant to record suicidal ideation. And here's the ASSERT study. Kelly referred to it briefly. Let me emphasize it. She co-authored this direct comparison of clinician-administered CSSRS with self-report computer-administered ECSSRS. The study found higher rates of disclosure of previous lifetime suicide attempts and other suicidal behaviors, self-aborted attempts, attempts that someone else interrupted, and planning for suicide, such as writing a note, suicide note, or buying a gun. Interestingly, there were a few patients who reported suicidal behaviors only to the clinic but far more reported them only to the self-report ECSSRS and not to the clinician. This showed that while false positive reports are always possible, they're substantially more likely to be made to a clinician and that the smallest risk and greatest safety are with self-report followed by further clinician face-to-face -face assessment. When searching the literature on candor and self-report versus clinician, clinician assessment of suicidality, I found six research groups using six different suicidality assessments in seven studies over 50 years, 
and candor and self-report was always greater than in clinician assessment. The FDA guidance that Kelly has mentioned, it was first published in 2010 with Tom Logren, the lead author, updated in 2012. Both the CSSRS, clinician administered, and the ECSSRS are, quote, acceptable and, quote, recommended. Acceptable is document conservative parlance. Recommended is operative and powerful. The CSSRS and the ECSSRS are identical, except the CSSRS clinician interview is compacted into two pages of semi-structured prompts and yields a handwritten report. The ECSSRS computer interview requires 29 pages that document exact branching logic to guide the path through six to 29 fully structured questions and provides an immediate real-time report. Here's the branching logic for the actual number of suicide attempts in ECSSRS. It's one page of 14 pages of this kind. This is hard for clinicians to master and execute consistently. So that the ECSRS is procedurally invariant. Here's the old way assessment with a clinician doing CSSRS. Here's the better way, patient self-report, ECSSRS assessment that's been in use for 14 years now. Validations of the ECSSRS are quite strong. In the first validation, comparing ECSSRS with two experienced CSSRS, CSSRS assessors who were trained several times by Dr. Posner in investigator meetings and in the week before the validation study trained again. The assessors disagreed with each other more than they disagreed with the ECSSRS. The voice and text versions of ECSSRS were shown to be equivalent. So studies can use either or both versions in regulatory research. Across psychiatric and non-psychiatric treatment studies, non-psychiatric as well as psychiatric, emphasizing that on purpose, ECSSRS baseline lifetime assessments of suicidal ideation and behavior were predictive of subsequent short-term suicidal behaviors. Cancers, as we all know, increase suicide risk. And across all studies of cancer treatments, ECSSRS advantages apply. Summing up, the ECSSRS provides the clearest signals for patient suicide risk, safety for treatments under study, and additional treatment benefit that may result from the treatment under study as it reduces suicide risk. These clearest signals come through computer interview standardization, greater patient candor with the ECSSRS, with added clinician evaluation. And most ECSSRS reports are negative and they need only brief clinician review. But when they are positive, they help the clinician organize and guide subsequent review. Well, with that, I want to say thank you and pass this back to uh, Libby for her, uh, now, excuse me, over to Sonia, who I think will uh, will get Libby, Libby, Libby involved. Thanks. <laughs> it's a and, tongue twister, isn't it? <laughs> can, I, can I just make one point that I, I didn't think to make before? Is that okay? Yes, go right ahead, Kelly. We're here to talk about cancer and in every other medical disorder, but what happens is that this matches clinical practice. If you go to Sloan Kettering to get your treatment or Dana-Farber or wherever, this is standard like a vital sign, right? So that's, that's important to know that whether, whether you're, it's in um, psoriasis, dermatology, or cancer treatment, the CSSRS is what 
providers in practice are going to be doing like they monitor for blood pressure? Getting, let me make the point that getting the clinicians to do the CSSRS is hard to gather them, focus them, and to get them to do it right. And the ECSSRS always does it right. And you get more disclosure. So. Well, yeah, and, 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 and any rater can do it. You don't need to be trained and, and out there in practice, you know, you know, you don't need any training or class, you know, and, and janitors to school teachers are doing it. But John's point is very much a good one. For optimal data, you're gonna you're gonna want the ECSSRS, but again, they they they're married very well together as well. Okay, and with that. Hey. Uh, I just want to say thank you very much, everyone, for uh, listening in to this great uh, discussion and presentation by Kelly and John. And now I'm just going to pass the mic over to Libby, and she will uh, moderate your Q&A. And as a reminder to our audience members, you still can continue to send in your questions by using that questions window, and we'll try to attend to your questions during the time we have together. So Libby, I sent you a bunch of questions there, so I'm just going to hand it right over to you to begin, and I'll see everyone in the closing. All right. Thank you very much. Um, so the first question is less of a question and more of a request. Um, please present this to Niels, Northeastern ALS Group. Um, all right, moving to the next one. So our second question, which is our first question. For computer-obtained CSSRS, we know the CRCs are reviewing. How are you getting folks to review real-time? So I guess that means to review um, at the actual site, maybe go through findings reports. Yeah, what happens is, right, they, there's immediate transfer, immediate alerting right then to whoever needs it, right? Whether it's the coordinator, the PI, et cetera. It, it, it's there, and there's no suicide risk monitoring like that. That's optimal, right? Immediate delivery of the, of the data and, and suicide risk information. Yes. In much, much, much more real time than, than anything else. <laughs> exactly. And in the school screening, our reports come back in less than a minute for each child as he or she is taking it. And, and I want to just add to that, that, that public health, one of the things we've known, we've identified in terms of what we need to do to move the needle to reduce suicide for our children or our communities in the United States is have a public health approach. Find people where they work, live, thrive, and learn because many people never get to the doctor. So Montana, where it's basically frontier, Right. So the state has invested a lot into into ECSSRS universal screening in the schools. And what is that? That's proactive, not reactive. Every single every single um, screening identified a kid or more than one kid that wasn't known to have a mental health problem. Right. So the ECSSRS and the C is really on the kind of cutting edge of saving lives in this nation. Okay. Um, let's see. Is there any rationale for using the CSSRS over the ECSSRS? Um, not really. I mean, I don't think there's any rationale. I, and, and I can't think of a place where that would be indicated. Like I said, there are plenty of places, like if you're in a hospital system or a school, it's not just going to be the ECSSRS. The teacher will have the questions. The kid will have the sign will be up in the bathroom. And these things complement each other, right? They don't replace each other. In my perspective, the time to use the CSSRS is when you can't get the ECSSRS. But the voice version through interactive voice response is widely available in over 100 languages now. And as we know, the internet is spreading so that doing it on a smartphone as kids do in school can be very widely disseminated. But there may be places where that isn't available and then yes, the CSSRS, however it's administered, gives a real advantage and leg up. Exactly, and that's, I remember 10 years ago, right, working with huge programs. So where we have the 60 translations in those 60 countries or whatever, we're gonna use ECSSRS and the 10 that don't, we're gonna use, we're gonna use paper or Rater 
And remember I said different data going in, same data going out. So it, that, and that's absolutely what, what should happen. Well, how will I, I mean, since there's the voice version of the ECSSRS, are patients sitting there for ages just answering to a phone? How long does it take for patients to complete the ECSSRS? It, we, we studied that carefully, and it takes less than four minutes for them to complete a negative assessment on average with 10 questions answered negatively, branched correctly to them. For a positive response with 22 questions answered, it takes still less than eight minutes. And, and the completion rate, if I can follow up with that, in registration trials was over 99%. And when it wasn't done, it was usually because the patient had been taken away from the ECSSRS to get their blood drawn, phlebotomy, before the phlebotomist went home and then they weren't put back to the, the thing. So completion rates and times involved are, are excellent. And I was going to say that that three minute completion time around included all the instructions that you needed to listen to, et cetera. It's very, very, very low burden and, 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 they, and they really like it. And we're getting the 99% completion rate over 99 in the kiddies to sixth grade through 12th grade. Yep. Oh, that's great. Um, so and I was going to say, and here's some cutting edge, cutting edge data. You know, there are these national guidelines like screen for depression after 12, screen for anxiety after eight, don't screen for suicide risk at all, as if when they're eight or nine or 10, they're just going to come tell you. Of course, that's absurd. Like you wouldn't need to take your blood pressure to do what it, it needs to do. So there was data out that showed that six to 11 year olds had the same odds of being high risk on the Columbia as 13 to 17 year olds, okay? Six to 11 year olds, but it also didn't increase ER length of stay, right? So we have to do it like a vital sign and it doesn't increase burden, it actually reduces it. Okay, well, so for the ECSSRS, um, what is the lowest um, age that you would recommend using it for? Down through age 12, it's been studied and with the general adult version, but Kelly is working on, may I say that, Kelly? Well, uh, no, I, I was going to say it's not an adult version. It's actually started in adolescence, so our standard version is for adolescents and adults and, mm -hmm. and 6 to 12 for a very, very long time. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, can I answer this one, John? <laughs> So, uh, I was wanting you to talk about what you're doing now, yeah. Yeah, we're doing, with NIH support, we've uh, modified it to be a preteen young child one. So there's an ECSSRS that is phenomenal for, you know, 6 to 12-year-olds. And, and it's self-report, and we have a parent version. And it's unbelievable. These kids are coming into the ER at, at, at Columbia, et cetera. Every single one, oh, my God three aborted attempts, two things, you know, intent to act, stuff you would never know about if we weren't doing this. So, so across the age span, you can actually do this and it's, it's quite, quite potent. And you don't find any issues with um, the younger patients having difficulty navigating the actual tablet or whatever they're completing the ECSSRS on? Well, the, at, for these young kids, there's somebody there, like a coordinator or whoever, to help them, you know, navigate it if they're having any issues. And, and so it's, it's so far had, had, has had tremendous um, feasibility outcomes. And Kelly, I think I'm right in saying that you have worked to try to make sure the language is better for very young children than the one for 12 and over. Yes, exactly. So instead of saying intent to act, it says this is something you would really do. You know, you, you don't ask a, a, a six-year-old about writing a will, right? So, you know, a few of the authors who are experts in young children, including myself, you know, spent a lot of time um, modifying the slight modifications that make a really, really big difference. But the, the outcomes have been unbelievable. All right, great. Okay, do you ever get a report of somebody at the site not reviewing the response? So is, is that something that is um, 
report it, I guess, not reviewing what whether or not it was a positive or negative. It's a protocol violation in my mind, yeah. But we, I, I in all these years, I, I, I don't really hear of that. You know, I haven't heard of that significantly. And, and yeah, and, and the other thing I wanted to say that I think is really important for all of you to hear is, you know, people exclude, right? If you have, you know, this 1% answer, but I have to tell you that FDA doesn't even want you to exclude. You know, when you look at the sickest trials, our, our Columbia co-authors, you know, borderline suicide attempters, bipolar suicide attempters in a year, right? No suicides. But even if there were, they expect they expect that. So when we did the Harvard Best Practices paper, should we exclude suicidal patients? The overwhelming answer is absolutely not. And I've been in closed door meetings like, should we make them have to do some? I mean, it, it, it really is all upside not to exclude at all, frankly. And that gives you the generalizability that you and they want. And, and again, there's really very, really no downside. Um, right. I, I did want to say, like, I had my my cell phone up there, our email. Both myself and John are really here, you know, and and Clario, of course, to really help with any of these things. To 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 come to your 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 sponsors, do lunch and learns. We're th this this has been a very very big passionate issue for me. The fact that lives can be taken. Okay, because people aren't getting important medicines to treat devastating diseases because of false signals has been a, a crusade for for us. And we are really, really here to help you, you know, do optimal m detection and 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 protect life saving life saving interventions. Okay. Um, here's a question for you, Kelly. Do you think that an SSRI that is developed for a rare disease in a population of people aged over 40 will inevitably get a black box warning? That's that would be an SSRI, SSRI developed for a rare disease population of over 40. You know, I'm hopeful. I told you they removed a black box from Chantix. If you looked at that that article that I showed you, it said, you know, we'll have to go back to this if we see more data. I've been in psychiatry products. I showed you the massive data they had showing that always where you see increased risk is placebo. So, you know, I'm hopeful that, you know, what they said in that article will will see happen. I can't swear by it, but even if there is I really believe that the more we communicate what we know, the better off you'll be. And you'll see things shifting, right? It's prescription rates, but eventually they went back up because we're telling the right story and people understand the issues. So when you, when you can market that life-saving information in the right way, even if there was a black box, you know. And, and by the way, we are always here to help with, the, with those things too, with the FDA consults and all that. Um, are ethnic differences taken into account in either the questions posed or the interpretation of the survey results? Yeah, so such a good question. You know, the Columbia is um, available in like 150 languages, I believe. And when the when the FDA first started requiring this, I used to get up in the middle of the night to India and China and do the trainings myself because I wanted to see the acceptability, right? And and the only question I ever got is, can we use this in, in our communities? But if you look in that, we have an evidence book, which is, you know, 100, over 100 representative studies, and you'll see beyond the linguistic validation, tons of, of science that supports from around the world, the cultural differences, you know, et, et cetera, et cetera. Are contextual translations important for the ECSSRS? So contextual as in contextual to a specific language or um, a specific region, are those important for the ECSSRS and the CSSRS? Well, when this first started, you know, there's, there's you know, 
five languages in India and, and, and five and, you know, and, and, and so a lot of that has been addressed and, and the, the validation, cross-cultural and language validation um, processes were the same, you know, for ECSSRS as, as CSSRS. So, so those considerations have definitely been taken into account. Um, pardon me, I'm reading through. And you know what? What we can do, you're, you're all going to get the slides, but we, we could also put um, a link to the website and to the evidence book, which, um, as, as well as to um, something across, across um, sponsors, um, there was a, a collaboration uh, with like 10 or 15 sponsors, biostatisticians, you know, a, um, a, an analysis guide and, and corresponding paper. Okay. Um, oh, hi, Sonia. Hello. <laughs> We're getting there to the end of the hour. Do you have a, another question or should I start the closing out? Um, I did. Okay, go right ahead. So, you can squeeze another one in. Okay. Um, this person would be interested to hear uh, your opinions on making PK and PD more standard to avoid issues like this of bad fitting medications being prescribed to individuals, increasing their individual risk of suicidality. Um, I'm not sure what PK and PD are, but um, pharmacokinetic, pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic. Oh, <laughs> so, okay. Before I did this, I, I used to run analog classrooms, which developed the you know the, the PK and PD data for the most of the most of the stimulants. So, um, I'm I'm not I'm not sure. You know, we hopefully one day we'll have corresponding markers and things, but we we know we know that. Suicide is our preventable cause of death. We know that detecting people at risk, which this does incredibly well, is the most important thing we can do. And then we will build on top of that. John? When Greg Simon, who's been looking at all the data, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, and with over 400 items out of uh, the medical record, they added very little to what is known from the CSSRS and the ECSSRS questions. The, very little, I mean, it was-, it was Oh my like gosh, I learned something today. <laughs> 1%, you know. So we've got to do the mother load first, and then yes, of course, we want every way we can to improve prediction, yep. All right. That's it then, okay. Well, thank you very much for those answers, John and Kelly, and thank you very much, Libby, for, uh, for moderating the Q&A. We've come to the end of the Q&A portion of the webinar, and if the team could not address all your questions, remember the team at Clario will follow up with you after this presentation. And if you have any further questions, please direct them to the email addresses that you see there on your screen, and there's also a website to check out there um, for Columbia that Kelly was uh, talking about. Anything else you wanted to add, Kelly? No, we're just really happy. And I'm sorry we had a little glitch with the with the with the slides, but hopefully um hopefully you 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 saw all the information, but you you're all gonna get them as well. The ECSSRS will not have that kind of problem. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect way to end. Perfect way to end it. Thank you, John, for that. Okay, and I just want to say additionally there is a link to this event of which you can also share with your colleagues once they register for the recording as well. So take a look for that. And a survey window will be popping up on your screen. Your participation is appreciated as it will help us to improve on our further webinars. And get even more out of today's presentation by downloading the supporting materials that we have available for you under the handouts tab. And there's two for you to check out there. So I encourage you to do that. Now please join us in thanking our speakers, Kelly and John, for that very insightful presentation presentation and Libby for moderating the Q&A. We hope you found this webinar informative. It has been my pleasure to be your webinar moderator. On behalf of the team here at X Talks, we thank you for joining us. Until next time, please take care and bye for now. Bye, John. Bye, Kelly. Bye, bye Libby. Bye, everyone. Bye. Libby, can, yes. can our presenter